morning, everybody. Um, my name is Roshan Shah. Um, I represent the manufacturing operations part of Georgia Pacific, and I'm responsible for what we call Collaboration Support Center, CSC, um, which, again, comprises of about 100 different people of uh, um, folks from data science team, uh, about 50 engineers, and some operations technology team. I didn't realize this when I had this uh, bar stool put up here, but I almost feel like this is a ventriloquist act, like I'm the dummy or something. <laughs> but uh, I'm pleased to be here. Good morning. My name is Steve Bacalar. As I introduced, I'm the VP of Digital Transformation. I have uh, a very talented group of people that deal with the collection of data, the running of the modeling platforms that we use in building the end user applications. Um, as Merrill kind of introduced, uh, we have a very special relationship, Roshan and I. Um, started about six years ago, and uh, we literally talk every morning, midday, and night. In fact, my spouse will, you know, kind of answer my phone and say, hey, your work spouse is on the phone, you know. And uh, it's through that relationship that I think we've been able to kind of do some pretty cool things. But, uh, you know, one thing I just realized, um, Roshan was in a video yesterday that you guys probably saw. And as close as we work together, uh, I noticed that there really wasn't any IT content in the, uh, in the video, Roshan. So, you know, he represents the data science side, I represent the IT side, and, you know, we have a running joke that the IT side represents probably 60 to 80% of the actual effort. The da data scientists are kind of like the celebrities that get on stage, and the IT is kind of like the roadies that do all the, the, the legwork. Um, but just to, to, to you know, always trying to have his back. We actually um, put together a video as well. We're gonna, uh, I'll, I'll have Roshan start in just a minute, but there was a third leg to this stool that's not up on stage, and he's sitting over in the back, a gentleman by the name of Paul Fredrickson, who is our operational leader that really drives the uh, usage and adoption across our facilities. And uh, he has a saying that there are workhorses and show horses. So for all the IT workhorses, uh, Roshan, could you uh, click to the next slide? Okay. We created something very special at GP to accelerate the innovation and transformation that is occurring within our manufacturing sites. We call it the Collaboration Support Center, or CSC for short. We leverage the most advanced technologies available to solve manufacturing operational challenges. A lot of the products we made, you might think of as being very simple commodities, towel and tissue products, wood products, but we make them at such scale and at such speeds, it's actually very sophisticated processes and technologies that enables that. While we are a large organization, we're the summation of small teams that are aligned to solve specific business problems, and we use a wide array of technologies to do that. So computer vision is using cameras and sensors in our facilities to detect abnormal events in our facilities. We use machine learning and data science models to detect when people are in spaces they shouldn't be in, when conditions are different than they might normally be, or when quality isn't up to our standards. The technologies that we are leveraging now through artificial intelligence and machine learning are giving us such insights that we were essentially blind to before. These are AI-driven projects which helps to optimize our workflows and it's really cool cutting-edge technology we're working with. We do things that aren't done elsewhere. Right? We're either creating new solutions, we're using technologies in ways that people haven't imagined. We get to work with the cool technologies, but we also get to see the product work and experience the value of it. A lot of the work we do is um, things that we hear about, we read about, but we actually get to do them. These are fun technology, and we're at the cutting edge of it. The CSC operates more like a startup rather than a big company, so you move at a lightning fast pace, you try out a lot of different new things. Don't underestimate what you can bring to the table. We value the marriage of bringing people's passions around technology, business problems that we're trying to solve, putting those two things together in order to drive value across the organization. Georgia Pacific does a really good job at enabling um, employees to um, find their passions and make that part of their role. We're incorporating people's creativity, intelligence, and acumen in in combinations. GP, like most companies, have an extensive portfolio of commercial applications. But I think what sets us apart is how we strive to use those ERP and supply chain systems in new and creative ways to come up with solutions that uh, didn't exist before either in our company or in our industry. 
we are laser focused on eliminating waste and inefficiencies in our supply chain. And at GP, you get to see that in multiple ways, either through your own um, kind of entrepreneurial behavior to, to be a self-starter in an area that somebody else hasn't taken the initiative, or to actually see the finished product in the marketplace. Why go to a place where you can think about doing something when you can do it right now, right here? Before you get started, I don't know if Tom's in the room. Just want to let you know, Tom, that's our recruiting video. We're going to be recruiting in the Midwest at the University of Illinois, Champaign. We're going to give you a run for your money for that new talent. Yeah, I, I don't know if we're going to try and recruit these guys here to write software, but cool. Um, all right, having had that off script moment. So who are we? What's GP? Um, I think you know many of us um, have interacted with our products, but it's not always um, like front and center, but as we'll walk through, you'll recognize a lot of these brands. You know, you're probably familiar with uh, Dixie Plates and uh, Brawny paper towels, or when you go to Costco and you buy Kirkland Signature uh, paper products, much of that uh, we manufacture at very large scale. Um, as a company, we're a subsidiary, a wholly owned subsidiary of Coke Industries. Um, GP has about three different business segments and collectively it makes up about 140 manufacturing facilities spread across North America and accounts for a little over 20 billion in annual revenue. We are, we are a privately owned company so we don't normally publish all of our financials, but that said, um, again, as, the, as we talked about, it covers across three different, uh, uh, three different operations, or three different business segments rather. Certainly a big part of American economy. Uh, again, you may or may not realize, but about 65% of households have our products uh, uh, represented. And 40% of all US businesses, you would see our products, whether that in the bathroom or break room or otherwise. So let's we'll start talking about the why first. Why do we do what we do? And it's really spread across uh, three different um, problems. The first one being talent. As I'm sure many of you relate to, we continue to struggle with folks who are retiring or taking different jobs, high turnover. And you know, in operations where we used to have folks with 20 years of experience that really knew how to operate this equipment are now run by you know, folks who have been there for six months or a year. And that's quite challenging because you can certainly backfill with some degree of challenge. You can backfill the number of people there, but you can't really backfill experience. And that's been, that's been a challenge for us. So as we think about how do we help somebody that's you know, been working for three years operate like they were, uh, or they had 20 years of experience, that's the first challenge. Uh, the second one you know, is there are greenfield sites, new facilities popping up everywhere. And for us to be competitive, to remain competitive, and to some degree get ahead of it, we have to figure out how do we, how do we get more of our assets as they exist, right? So it's really a, a competitive pressure. Um, the thought process that we can recapitalize our assets as they exist is not really a profitable venture. So there's a huge challenge for us to figure out how we can get more of, out of our existing 140 manufacturing facilities. I'll let Steve talk and, about that. And, and as we've been talking about, you've seen it literally on the um, architectural charts from C3, the technology that is available today, open source or, or value-added uh, platforms, is tremendous, whether it's cloud, you know, multi-threading, in-memory, um, massively parallel processing, everything through the cloud and the edge has become very economical to experiment with. So we have a very iterative, kind of growth mentality around the use of technology and we're very fortunate to have leadership at the highest levels within Coke and our sister companies that really put an emphasis and we believe that technology advantage is essential to our success. So now that we've kind of established the why, let's talk about a little bit of how, the approach. And uh, you know, as we talk through this, please note that you know, these, it's easy to talk about right now but these have been quite painful lessons learned. Um, so for us, the most important thing, probably point number one and two, uh, would be organizational alignment. What do I mean by that? 
It's effectively getting everybody aligned on what's the problem we're solving, is this really valuable, and is this going to you know, help us achieve the goals that we want to achieve, right? Uh, I think Meryl talked about it early, and Steve and I have a you know, pretty good competitive relationship, but that said, it starts with us, and we don't get into a lot of, hey, you didn't tell me this was a business requirement, and therefore what you know, I built for you is perfectly fine, and I'm in a tough spot saying, no, you don't have the right data, or this is not making sense. That, that fight, we don't have those. Now, we certainly used to, but then we had, you know, um, we had to build that trust over time, and there is a very strong realization that without IT, we're not gonna be successful, and without our buy-in and support, IT is really just a cost to be managed versus a um, value driver for the organization. And of course, that goes way beyond uh, IT and operations. It's really from when we build a model, we have to ensure that someone's going to use it, and we have to make sure that there is an iterative approach to it. The thought process that we're gonna build something and it's gonna be perfect day one, yeah, that never works. So that understanding that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna experiment, we're gonna discover, and we're gonna build better versions of things is something that we spent quite a bit of time um, aligning. And across 140 manufacturing facilities, across 30,000 people, that becomes quite challenging. So that's the most important thing I could say. The second one, you know, I would say is starting with problems that matter. So for example, if you, if you work on a lot of AI projects that you know, amount to half a million dollars, well, you're gonna work on a lot of them and then you're gonna start fighting over, well, what did I do? What was my contribution? While well, you have everybody breathing down your neck around, yeah, did that really make us money? Because I can't find that in the P&L. Right? So for us, the, the thought process has been, if we work on problems that are worth $50 million or $100 million and we are making progress, yeah, we may be wrong and we might get $40 million or $60 million worth of value, but there's not a lot of debate around it because very quickly it becomes evident that those problems have added value. And yeah, we might be wrong a little bit, but it's certainly adding to the bottom line and we can go. So that's been a key lesson for us is let's not work on a lot of little problems. Let's work on a few but really important and really strategic goals. Anything you'd add to that, Steve? No, I'm good. Okay. All right. So starting with what are the problems for us? And we call this asset health. Effectively what this means is, you know, as a, um, as a company, we have a lot of rotating assets that unfortunately fail all the time. So how do you get ahead of that? So over the last many years, we've implemented about 90,000 vibration sensors. They come in all different flavors and all different um, you know, shapes and sizes and brands. As we talked about, 140 manufacturing facilities, we as a company grew via acquisition. So we have one of everything. Just to give you a flavor for it, we have 11 different instances of CMMS systems. Right? So that becomes quite challenging for us. In this case, what we've been uh, able to work on is take those 90,000 sensors and be able to deploy um, anomaly detection models that help us understand what could be wrong. And to illustrate a point, I don't know if it's visible, but if you look, if you look towards the, um, on that image, there it, says, it says four of 40. What that's showing is across 90,000 sensors that's sending data to us every 10 minutes, we can tell you the 40 that really matter, the 40 that is likely to fail in the next 45 days and the ones we should prioritize the work around. What does that mean for us? That effectively means for all the folks that are in our facilities, instead of everybody going and manually taking readings on a route base or schedule base and looking for problems, we can rely on AI to tell us where the problems are so we can guide the work for folks on actually going and fixing versus looking for problems. And it's a fairly significant opportunity for us and you know, as a company, it's, it's worth nine figures to us and we've been able to uh, cut into that quite a bit. And we'll talk a little more about results here in a minute. The second one, and this is where C3 has been incredibly powerful for us, is the ability to merge asset data, the vibration data with process data. You might ask, why is that important? Well, first, that data, all that data lives in quite a few different disparate systems and it becomes 
it's massive data. We're talking trillions or tens of trillions. What C3 has been able to help us with is put all of that data into a, I don't know the fancy terms, but a unified structure such that we can identify processes that lead to asset failures. Why is that important? Over the last five years, what we've learned is we've gotten pretty good at identifying when a failure will occur, the failure mode, and avoiding an unplanned event. Said differently, we've, been, we've gotten pretty good at identifying you know, and replacing parts before we should be replacing the parts. In other words, we don't really get to the root cause of the problem. What merging the asset and process data has helped us do is understand how do we run that process such that we get most optimal life and we don't even end up on that you know, P2F curve as it's known. And it's been, it's been worth quite a bit of money to us. So before you go on forward, if you could back it up. So a point I wanted to make on this slide that um, has been particularly influential. So you say, oh, okay, well, say there's, in this particular case, there's nine discrete data sources. It's work orders. It's uh, vibration data. It's process data. And what's the big deal putting that all in one data store? I mean, that can't be that hard, right? I mean, why is it taking IT maybe 60 or 80 percent of the effort in this? So one thing that was particularly helpful um, where C3 kind of help us get to a, a, a pivot point and, of progress. Um, if you think about the paper making process where you take trees and you put them into a, a very complex cooking process and essentially this, the, the trees as they get chipped and cooked, it, you, you generate a pulp and it goes into large storage tanks and then eventually gets fed or pumped into kind of a, a paper machine where it gets laid out on a screen and pressed and dried and so forth. I know Paul's proud of me right now as I'm describing our paper making, who's, Paul's our chemical engineer uh, by trade. But uh, the point of it is, is it's difficult to align the data by time, right? Because you've got this continuous process of trees being converted into pulp, and the quality of that pulp has a direct effect on whether that paper's gonna break or what the quality of that paper is that has certain specifications that it has to hit. Um, you kind of saw some of the equipment in the video, but you know, I don't know about you guys, and hopefully I'm not getting too personal, but like when I go to the restroom and I'm pulling the, the roll of toilet paper, it's kind of hard for that paper not to tear. Well, think about a, a roll of paper the size of your kitchen, and it's running at 60 miles per hour, and you don't want that thing to tear because if it does, you lose about an hour of production, which is, you know, could be 50, 100 grand worth of revenue. Um, the point of it is, is aligning data in a time series structure from multiple sources is a pretty, pretty tricky event. And you don't wanna discard data sources because that creates some bias and you might be discarding data that actually influences that process that you didn't anticipate. So the data engineering piece is pretty critical and one thing C3 does is allow, as you've probably heard, they have a canonical model structure or a schema that allows you to map all this data and then do that kind of data alignment work that's, uh, that was very strategic for our needs. Third use case I'd offer here, um, and these are just the three that we picked, there are quite a few others, is around computer vision. To just talk through it really quickly, it effectively, you know, our historical approach has been, we're gonna hire an operator who's been there for six months, and we're gonna give them 300 different controls and things to do during a shift, but then we also want them to watch a whole bunch of these cameras, so they're uh, adjusting many different processes to get the optimal production goals, while also staring at these you know, eight different uh, TV screens. What ends up happening is they're stressed out and they can't look at that. And those are quite important. So what we've been able to do um, is take those pre-existing cameras and write some Python mo models on them, run them at the edge, and as those models get better, connect that to process control such that we don't have to have somebody staring at that screen. And that's been quite powerful because we're not just making it so the operator doesn't have to stare at that screen while adjusting all these other controls. It also means we can make it so you know, the cameras are able to do their job as opposed to just reporting an event. Um, it's again been quite a powerful and quite, um, quite profitable for us. Um, just a quick thought um, that I wanted to mention. First of all, we see tremendous potential in leveraging, candidly, existing kind of commodity uh, cameras that are used for surveillance today or just monitoring for safety reasons. 
in the video, you saw some of the examples of how we're taking those data streams from those cameras and actually putting a kind of an area of interest when it comes to prohibitive space or safety issues where we don't want humans to interact with machines or, or we're detecting quality issues in our Dixie cups or we're determining when a huge sheet of OSB that's going down a production line is misaligned or is overextending its space to where it can jam the process or create a fire hazard. The point of it is, is we see computers evaluating video streams with very low cost cameras. Now, we also have some specialized cameras that deal with um, imaging for furnaces that ultimately heat our kilns. But the point of it is you can start with a lot of infrastructure you have today in many cases and be a little resourceful, a little creative. And this technology is so quick to work with. Um, we've got some of these capabilities that's deployed at 40 sites in, in, in a relatively short period of time. It is complex in the sense there's an edge component and a cloud component. You've got to work through all that from an IT perspective. But we think this is a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, important area that everybody should be thinking about leveraging. So what does this all account to? Or how does this all come to the bottom line? The punchline I would offer you is over the last five years, we've seen that you know, annual value capture continue to increase. But on an annual basis, we can see nine figures, so hundreds of millions of dollars. I won't get into specifically how much, but that's been quite powerful for us to be able to see the use of artificial intelligence helping us get to that value. That also translates into several percentage points on OEE. So it's been, it's been quite, quite helpful, quite powerful, uh, and we've got much more work to do. Um, where we talked about asset health, so this is where we see unplanned events down by over 50%. Of course, wherever we have sensors. Um, and on any given day, we can see about half a million sensors going through our, traversing through our systems and AI in real time. So all of this sounds really cool, really good, but you know, it didn't start that way. Um, we talked about organizational alignment being the, the most important thing here. But you know, the, the second thing is also starting with the problem versus technology. You know, all of us have been interacting with different folks that would, you know, you go get dinner with them and then you kind of become infatuated with that technology and you put that sticker on your laptop and you feel like, nope, that's it. That's the thing that's going to save the day. And that may be absolutely right. But if you don't start with what is the problem we're trying to solve, then everything else becomes um, overhead or fixed cost that somebody's going to want to, you know, go after. And they should. So our, our lesson has been, let's ensure we start with the problem and let's figure out the right technology that feeds into it. And the third thing is time value of money. One example I'd offer you that you know, we've uh, spent quite a bit of time kind of arguing, and it's going to be a bit contentious, is going to be this concept of data lake and fixing all the data before we can do something with it. And this is where you know, Steve and I have kind of wanted to punch each other at times. But um, the crux of the issue is, by the time you clean up all the data so that somebody can do AI or BI on it, it doesn't really work that way. And we have some scars to prove it. We've tried creating data like 11 different times, just in the realm of manufacturing operations, and it's petabytes of data, and failed, only to realize that by the time you clean up the data and put something in a you know, right schema and right format and the right structure so a data scientist can come build a model, when a data scientist is going to build a first version of the model, they will realize they need the data a little differently. Or when they put it into production and you, now you want to run it every minute or every second or every day or what have you, you're going to have to go change all that data structure, which means you kind of go back to the drawing board. And God forbid you have to build like eight different versions of that model, you're going to clean up that data lake and rebuild that so many different times that you're going to have quite a few people asking, hey, are you working on the right thing? What, what is kind of the return on investment and all that stuff? And that becomes painful. And we've lived through that. And our lessons have been leave data where it is, use that data, export it into SQL. And IT guys hate pulling data and giving you a copy as we've all kind of seen, but this is where you know, we kind of go have a conversation in a room and come out of it saying, okay, all right, we'll figure that piece out. But the, the, again, the message I would leave you with, our kind of lesson learned is there is value to be had by moving fast. 
and you know you you want to be able to provide feedback on it. So the thing that's you know kind of unique for us is we ensure whatever we do, we give daily feedback. We have um, stand-ups, right, where everybody gets together. It's like about 50 people on a call, and the very first question every single time is, what technology is not working the way it should be? And if we, for some reason, have built shelfware, that gets tossed or decommissioned like very, very quickly. Um, and IT guys hate it when we start with the technology first question, but you know, the kind of the mental model we've developed is, if somebody's not complaining about an IT system, that's because nobody's using it. Um, and we kind of Okay, he stole my line. I'm a little ticked off. That was going to be one of my lines, but that is a really important point, and I'm going to, I'm going to take the baton. IT in well, how many people represent IT in this room? Just out of curiosity. Okay, so. It's like three people. So I won't, I won't offend too many people. <laughs> Hopefully it won't be too many people to get upset with what I'm about to say, but I've been doing this for 40 years. I was a consultant and then I've been at GP for 28 years. And, and if I've learned anything over that period of time, IT tends to be risk averse. We want everything up 100% of the time, fully reliable, available, scalable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all those th things. The reality is, is we're in, a, we're in a groundbreaking territory where we don't understand or know what all the needs are. And so what's really more important than being risk averse is having a very quick feedback loop. And so you've got to be open to daily feedback of what's not working. And you will, you've got to be open to taking risks and building things in ways that maybe aren't architecturally perfect, but are directionally correct. And, and having that mindset is not easy in the, in the area of maybe where you're building very complex integrated ERPs. But when you're dealing with AI and ML, you can start out a little bit more agile, a little bit more risk-oriented, and, and, and build it over time. So um, one of the earlier slides, it talked about how, uh, Roshan talked about how you would want to work on really large projects. And there was a, a few words, correlation, um, causation, corrective action, and selective automation. So the big problem was how to make sure asset reliability delivered literally tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, to the bottom line. We had a hypothesis that those four steps were the path. Not, not the first step wasn't worth 50 million, but then in concert grew exponentially in terms of value. So you kind of carve up the problem, and then you kind of carve up the technology, and you do something that's a little bit more pragmatic in the process. And then you've got to have IT people that are really willing to hear daily feedback and know it's not personal, and that it's just about, it's really the way the users of today are communicating requirements. They have to use something to see what works, and then they can actually say what they like and don't like, versus anticipate what the solution looks like before they've even touched it. Only thing I might correct is he said he learned a few things, and that's not true. I, I am a, I'm a slow learner. That's true. Um, <laughs> so in, in all of this, of course, we have, uh, you know, as, as Meryl alluded to, you know, we. And don't get me wrong, we have quite a few conversations where we just kind of don't want to answer the phone call anymore, right? But it's been, it's He's never, usually wrong, by the way. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it, it's the realization that all of us have the same goal, we all kind of have the same badge, and we all got, get paid by the same set of shareholders. It's more about ensuring that we are aligned, and it's not about we need to get to zero risk. It's more about figuring out how can we create more value and that we all work for the same team. And yes, there are quite a few instances where it's not pleasant, but ultimately it's not personal and you know, we kind of get past that. And that brings me to my you know, final point that as much competitiveness and I give him a lot of crap about his alma mater, but it's more about figuring out how can you have good partners? You know, and, and for us, you know, it's our cloud uh, offering. It's the various platforms that we use. And, but most importantly, the, the people that come with it that will stand by you at 1.30 in the morning when a system goes wrong. And it's not finger pointing, right, that says, well, you didn't give me the requirement for high availability. I don't even know what that means. But all I can share is at 1.30 in the morning when something is not working or we're building something, we kind of need to be on the same phone, uh, same phone call, and it's not about, oh, well, that Kubernetes cluster failed, or again, don't know what that means. But it's more about ensuring that when something fails, we're all in it together, and we'll figure it out. And it's not about, let's go pull out the business requirements document. 
none of that matters when you know, you've got, because I too have customers on the other line, manufacturing facilities that are calling me and asking, well, how come you guys didn't see that failure occur because that just took us down for eight hours? And me pointing to IT saying, well, these guys messed up with their Kinesis stream or it, it doesn't really help us, right? It's just figuring out how we can have the right solution and having the group of folks that you trust that will have your back, that becomes about the most important thing there is. That's about. And, and I guess just to show our appreciation, I will say that the talent pool at C3 is pretty impressive. And part of that partnership, you know, the, what we strive to do within the IT group, what Roshan's team strives to do within the data science and operations group, we all try to be very resourceful. And I think that's what kind of works in the relationship we have is that notion that we know we're in uncharted territory and we're going to be resourceful. Now, we just ran out of time, but he introduced a statement that didn't maybe resonate with you guys, which is he makes fun of my alma mater all the time. And since my alma mater was mentioned yesterday, I can't avoid telling you this joke. So I went to Rice University in Houston, and he always introduces me as Steve Backler, who went to Risotto University. <laughs> And then, now Roche has been to a lot of prestigious schools. He's been to MIT and Duke, but he actually got his undergraduate degree at the University of Florida, obviously here in the state. And so my response to him is always, well, I don't know if you guys know this, but when you graduate from the University of Florida, you get a case of suntan lotion. So that's, that's my comeback. Obviously, it didn't play as well to you guys. It plays very well when you're back at the office. But nonetheless, we, we appreciate the time we've had to share our story. Hopefully, you've kind of picked up on a few concepts. But I will say that um, humor drives innovation. And if there is a way you can incorporate that into kind of the dynamics, we think that's pretty powerful. Thank you.